We are so excited to introduce you to artist Gerald Clark, and we are honored to have his work being featured tonight. We want to first start with a land acknowledgement. The UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university was built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We are honored to share this space with them and we thank them for their stewardship. And this land acknowledgement was adapted from the UCSD Intertribal Resource Center. If you would like to learn more about the Kumeyaay Nation and the people, you can go visit their website at kumeyaay.com. Additionally, if you are not currently living in the Kumeyaay territory, you can go visit uh, native-land.ca to learn more about whose land you are residing on. Next, we would like to thank our co-sponsors for this event. We would like to thank the Native American Heritage Month organization here at UCSD. We would also like to thank SPACES or Student Promoted Access Center for Education and Service. And, service. and lastly, we would like to thank NASA or the Native American and Indigenous Student Alliance. So NASA or the Native American and Indigenous Student Alliance is a student organization and one of our affiliates here on campus. They work to provide education on Native American culture and beliefs, as well as build and support community for Native students and allies on campus. Additionally, they work closely with other campus departments and programs such as the Intertribal Resource Center and the Kumeyaay Community Garden at, Mar at Marshall College. Um, if you would like more info, you can visit their Facebook page linked below, as well as their Instagram. And they also uh, have an upcoming powwow happening on Saturday, May 21st. Mm -hmm. So you can save the date for that. If you'd like more information on the powwow, you can go visit uh, NASA's Facebook page, again, linked below, as well as the Intertribal Resource Center and our Cross-Cultural Center e-news. So now we wanted to give an introduction about the artists y'all are going to be hearing from today. So we're going to get to know Gerald Clark. He was born in Hemet, California, and he's a member of the Kawea Band of Indians. He currently serves as a professor of ethnic studies at the University of California, Riverside. And he's breaking quite a few barriers and glass ceilings. He's the first Native American, Native Californian American to have a tenured position at a UC. So big round of applause for him. Um, he teaches classes in California indigenous history and culture, as well as contemporary Native American art and related social issues. When he's not teaching or in the studio, Gerald assists in running the Clark Family Kettle Ranch, which we'll get to know a little bit more about throughout his presentation today and he remains heavily involved in Korea culture. If you want to learn more about him and his artwork, you can check out his website, which we've linked below. It's www.geraldclark.net. And so with that, we're gonna hand it over to him. So go ahead and share screen when you're ready. All right, well, thank you everybody. Uh, uh, glad to be here. Uh, excited to, to be here with you uh, this evening. And you know, um, it's a humbling thing, you know, to, uh, and I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, the, it's a humbling thing to be able to talk about your work. And, and, you know, we're all so busy in our lives today that it's really, um, it's really nice, yeah, to be able to share your work and spend some time with people. So I, I really appreciate the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, I want to uh, uh, show my appreciation to uh, the organizations who are sponsoring uh, this this event. And we're going to try to be somewhat entertaining for you uh, in this kind of investigation of, of what I've been up to. So indeed, my name is uh, Gerald Clark, and I'm, I'm actually talking to you tonight from my family's traditional home here on the Kawea Indian Reservation. And oftentimes when I do, um, when I do artist lectures, you know, I don't just start with the art. I, I start from like where I'm from, because um, where I'm from informs how I see the world. And it's the lens, it's the lens that I look through and, and how I perceive 
you know, uh, the world here in the 21st century. And so I always, I always start my lectures with, with this where I'm from. And so this is, um, I live here on the reservation, it's about 20,000 acres. And I care, uh, I'm a caretaker for uh, my family's cattle ranch. A lot of people don't know some of the first cowboys in California were actually the California Indians, because when the Spaniards stumbled into the lands we now call California, they brought with them livestock, but not enough people to help raise those, those animals, you know. And so the Indians stepped in, learned the craft. And so, yeah, so I live here on the reservation and those little black dots you see in the, um, in the, uh, the photo there, those are uh, some of our cows. And, and so I spend time with my elderly aunt, uh, particularly during COVID and uh, when everything shut down, I just spent time with her and I heard her stories and we'd sit there. This is from a picture from her back porch looking over our, our fields and stuff. So um, yeah, this is kind of, it, it's kind of, it informs me, right? It informs the, the work I do and, and, uh, and the, the, the kind of arts that I make. And so like around this area, and my people have been here for thousands of years, right? The, um, I, this is uh, some stone boulders that are near where I, I grew up. And you see those little indentions, you see the little divots and the holes. Um, that's from like generations, thousands of years of Kauia people who uh, one of our traditional foods is acorn. And in fact, I'll be cooking some tomorrow to prepare for our Thanksgiving family dinner on uh, Thursday. But, uh, you know, for me, history is not something you, you take for a quarter class or, you know, a, a textbook that you might have to read um, for, for a test or whatever. For me, you know, history is like, it's something that's real, you know, and it's around me. And so these boulders, they're, they're, they're little, literally hard as a rock. <laughs> and so it takes like, you know, generations to do these little holes here in the, in the rock. And that's where they're grinding the acorn into flour so that they can then cook it and, and, and make food. And so for me, you know, history is not something that's an abstract concept or a story. It's physically, it's, it's all around me. And I see it in the landscape uh, here where I live. And, you know, recently, I guess within the last four or five years, you know, we hear uh, talk of people in social media and the news media, and they talk about alternative facts. And this is something that I think fake news, right? And I think we're, we're talking a lot about these things right now in, in social media or what have you. But, I, you know, I always tell my students, I tell my, my kids, like, I grew up with alternative facts. <laughs> that's U.S. history. <laughs> that's what we, we learned when we were in school, you know. And again, these books are full of these stories, uh, which is, tends to be one person's version of, of that story, right? And so I'm, I'm a professor of ethnic studies. And, you know, one of the accusations, uh, uh, stereotypes of ethnic studies is somehow we, we hate this country and we're trying to rewrite the history. And that's not it at all. Um, I often say to my students, you know, none of us are as good looking as our social media profile picture. And America is the same way. So these books, what they're presenting is, is America's profile picture, but it's, it doesn't have all the blemishes. It doesn't have those negatives that are part of this country's history. So in terms of uh, Native American studies or ethnic studies, we're not changing, we're not changing uh, the history. We're adding to it all the things that were probably left out in the overall story. So again, when I think of history, it's real to me. It's, it's the stories I hear from my aunt when we're sitting in the evening watching the cows. It's here in the landscape that I, that I live in. And this is, I know of a, a, an old village site where I can go. I can actually just pick up these pottery shards that are laying on the ground. I, I don't know, I've never carbon dated them, but they're hundreds, if not possibly thousands of years old. And that's my history. That's my people's history. And it's real. And I feel that. And to be honest with you, when I, as an artist, when I walk into the studio, you know, that's kind of the weight that I carry into the studio uh, um, is this, this history. And some of it is tragic. Uh, but a lot of times I think, uh, it's, it amazes me that uh, the Indian people are, are around today because we've we've managed to survive a state-sponsored genocide, you know. And so in a lot of ways, Indian people, myself, my daughters, we're the ultimate success story because we're evidence, right? And, and we're still here of this failed genocide that happened here in California, particularly. Now, one of the things, let me show you an artwork here. So another thing that I try to do in my, anytime I lecture, talk about my work, 
is try to be honest with people of, of who I am. So my dad was uh, a native man. Uh, his parents, my grandparents, they met at Sherman Indian School there in Riverside. And uh, my grandmother was Kawia, and that's why my dad and then now me and my kids were all registered here at Kawia. But my grandpa, my, my dad's dad, uh, he was Wallapai from Northern Arizona. And they, he met my grandma at boarding school where you know, students from different tribes were all gathered and basically uh, assimilated, right? They were taught assimilation practices uh, in this, this federal government school or what have you. So that's my dad's side of the family. And so there I am in the middle, and that's a little image of me there on the left, and that represents my dad's side of the family. But my mom's side of the family, my mom was a white lady, and her family moved here to Southern California from the Texas Oklahoma panhandle back in the Dust Bowl days. So I'm not a full-blooded native. Uh, in fact, I'm not even uh, half Kauia because I'm a quarter Kauia and a quarter Wallapai because of my grandparents meeting at that school, you know. And so the, the title there, if you notice, and any of you have ever taken an art class, the title is uh, The Problem with Color Theory, right? And, uh, you know, if you take equal amounts of red and uh, white, you get pink, right? Well, I'm not pink, right? And so what, what I'm looking at is like, you know, when we talk about ethnicity or race in this country, and we talk about people being white, black, red, yellow, green, I guess the aliens are some kind of gray or what have you, you know, it's like this dumbed down system that doesn't really represent who we are as people, as living, breathing human beings that feel emotion and have uh, desires and intellectual, you know, thought, right? And so I'm criticizing that system with this, the problem with color theory, because I'm not pink, right? I'm a, I'm a living human being. Uh, but, you know, I grew up, I'm, I'm a bit older now. So I grew up in the the 70s. And, you know, like here in America, boys in the 70s, what did we do? Uh, well, we played cowboys and Indians, right? Uh, I don't know what they do today. It's probably some kind of Pokemon thing or something. I have no clue. I'm out of touch. Um, and I found this photo on, on Google and I just thought it was hilarious, you know. But uh, for myself, uh, early in my life, I was like, oh, well, which side do am I supposed to, um, to join here when you play Cowboys and Indians? And obviously you would think, oh, well, he'll join the, the Indian side of it, right? But here's the thing. I grew up uh, as, a, as an Indian cowboy. Again, uh, the Indians in California were some of the first cowboys in California. And so that picture on the far left, that's my dad and my grandpa. And they were hardcore Indian cowboys, boy, the hard workers. And uh, you can see they even have pistols on their, on their hips there from their belts. And then there's my dad in the middle. And then that picture on the far right, that's me. And so even at like age, what is that, age six, they have me on the tractor, you know, pitching in or what have you. And this is how I grew up. And so understanding this like, oh, well, people don't know about Indian people very much. I learned at a very early age that the stereotypes, the categories that we put people in are fake. They don't actually really exist, right? Because it's, it's usually based just like the red, white, yellow, and black. They, they exist in this kind of dumbed down abstract form, right? So here's uh, some of my cows. And um, this is kind of what I do. I enjoy the work, uh, physical work with ranching. And it's, you know, as a professor or as an artist, sometimes it's really easy to live inside your head. And so the cows, they keep me from doing that because they'll run me over <laughs> if, I, if I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing and dreaming and thinking. And it helps me keep it real, I think. And so here's a picture. This is at my house. And we have Indian cowboys from all over Southern California who come to my, my ranch. Uh, end of May, 1st of June, we have our big cattle roundup where the cowboys will rope. And they're all Indians. And we brand and vaccinate and castrate our, our calves. And this is kind of, that's me in the middle with the cowboy hat. And so you see there, the, the, the word at the bottom there, sovereign identity. Uh, I'm not willing, like sovereignty, right, is a control. Like the, my tribe is a sovereign nation, and that means we have a government and we uh, try to address the needs of our people, right? Well, for me, sovereignty can be applied to us as individuals. And I'm, I assert my sovereignty not to have to be America's Indian, right? I also assert my uh, sovereignty that I don't have to do what America thinks is Native American art. You see, 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I, what I am. I, I am being who I am and what seems most natural to me. And so this idea of, of you can ask yourself, what about your own sovereignty? You know, are, are you being dictated by outside, right? Or, or are you really doing what you feel like you want to do, you know? And, you know, this is one of my heroes. That's my dad right there. And uh, my dad, uh, the little, I left that in the picture. You see that little kind of bird feeder there to the right? Uh, my dad actually found that and it was all rusted out, and no good. And he actually brought it home and he fixed it up and he screwed some wood onto it and added those cups. And now it's a, like a bird feeder. And, um, you know, that I think that's where a lot of my art influence comes from is we grew up so, you know, so darn poor that we, uh, um, you, you couldn't always buy stuff to play with or whatever. So my brother and I, we would build forts and our own skateboard ramps and we made our own Halloween costumes. And I think that poverty, right, really kind of was part of my training as an artist. And you're going to see my work. If there's a little bit of a kind of, uh, you know, a, a creative kind of uh, play that, that I, I do when I create my work. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to romanticize being poor because there were many times when we were almost homeless. There were many times when we had nothing to eat or had no electricity. Indeed, the house that I, I'm talking to you at, uh, from tonight uh, we didn't get running water till I was already out of high school. We had an outhouse and everything was outside. It was, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a 19th century way of living here, right here in the 20th, well, now 21st century. Uh, so let me talk about some of my artwork. But these are, I always try to kind of, you know, give some background because this is what I think and this is how I feel and how I view the world. So this is one of my artworks. This is called Manifest Destiny from 2006. And one of the things you're going to see in my work is I like to get pre-existing things and work them into my artwork, okay? And so here you see, this is a sculpture that is an actual working gumball machine, okay? And there's a cowboy hat at the top, and there's a, a, a plaster Greek-style column at the bottom. And um, one of the reasons why I do that, and I think it comes from that, like that slide of my dad and that, that bird feeder, is just, you know, being creative and grabbing things and finding new uses for them. There's, there's this ancient practice that some people think is new. Uh, it's called recycle, reuse, repurpose. That's an ancient practice by indigenous people globally, you know. And so in a lot of ways, that's what I'm doing here. Now, some of you probably uh, know that, that concept of manifest destiny. It's that 19th century doctrine that basically Americans, white Americans said, well, God wants us to have all the land and too bad, you Indians, right? And it's kind of something for nothing, right, <laughs> is, is, is the way it equates. And so this is what I did. Uh, I got this gumball machine. Can you see I covered it with this pattern of the American flag? That's with the red and the blue you see on the sides there. And then what I did was this, you know, those plastic capsules like uh, that you um, sometimes you'd buy that cheap little ring or the bracelet or a rubber ball and it'd be in that plastic capsule. So this this gumball machine actually works. So you put in a, a quarter and you crank the handle and you get one of those capsules. And it's hard to see in the slide here, but inside the capsules, it just takes 25. Oh, sorry about that. It just takes 25 cents. But these capsules are all fill, full of dollar bills. OK, hey, that's a good deal, right? Uh, spend 25 cents and get a dollar. Well, of course, I'm not going to let you have a dollar for 25 cents. So I have a divider inside the machine. And so when someone puts a quarter in and cranks it, they get their capsule. And inside it is a little slip of paper that defines manifest destiny. So what I'm basically doing is uh, ripping off the viewer here, the art goer. And they're, I'm giving them a little taste of what it felt like to be on the other side of Manifest Destiny, uh, because uh, in, in the way I put it, God wants me to have your quarter, okay? And so I have this kind of faux, you know, the American flag thing going, and it has this kind of nice look, this official look with the Greek columns. Uh, there at the bottom. But that was my idea was to kind of turn Manifest Destiny around. But also the fact that I'm using a gumball machine and a cowboy hat and, and things like that, I found that most people who go to museums today, they're kind of afraid of contemporary art because it is kind of weird, right? And you, you, you know, um, we, 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 we've all taken many, many classes to learn how to read and write, right? 
literature classes on how to interpret text or what have you. And hopefully you all have your favorite book, right? And that's a lot of training went into that. Uh, when it comes to art, people somehow think you should just know it. You should just get it. And it's not true. You have to do work in order to understand contemporary art. But one of the things that I do in order to overcome people's fears is to use everyday objects. So any of you who happen to go to a supermarket or a drugstore today, chances are you walk right by a gumball machine on the way out, right? So this is a way that I can use to kind of bring people into my work, something familiar to bring them in. And then I kind of, you know, hit them with something uh, that they're not really expecting. Uh, the next work is called Ethnopoly. And this is an artwork that basically started, basically I made a board game based on the game Monopoly uh, as an artwork. So I made the, the, the board, uh, the game board, I made all the cards, I made the playing pieces, and then I set it on this table. Um, I uh, actually wrote uh, rules to go with the game. And then you notice I painted the chairs. So I have to confess, this is kind of like uh, a frightening work for me. It, it, it's highly offensive. And there are things in this game that are basically racist, okay? Now listen, it's so easy as an artist to offend people and offend society. And it was a lot of fun like when I was 15, okay? But really, what am I doing here? Uh, I'm actually including things in this game that I find offensive, but that I also understand is real in American society. So let me give you an example. Uh, the, the different spaces going around the, the game board um, actually correspond to different sites here in the United States that are related to ethnic or racial violence, right? Or, or some kind of commerce or something, right? And you pick up a card and it says, oh, time to pay your car insurance. The white player pay $75, uh, the black player pay $150. And like, that's racist, right? but that exists in, in America. So my, my idea was if I could get people to play the game and to start talking, because that's what happens when you play a game, you start talking and it begins to shine a light on these inequalities that exist in our world. And why is it that we're okay with that, right? Uh, if you'll notice the chairs here, so whatever chair you sit in, that's the ethnicity that you have to play as, right? So you get a, you get a chance in a silly way to, to take, you know, walk in someone else's shoes. And I would point out, that there is, there is money and it's just like Monopoly, right? But it, the white player is always the banker. <laughs> that's part of the rules here. And again, completely ridiculous and racist, but that's the reality half the time here in America. Um, one of the things that I talk about a lot in, in, my, in my work and, and in, um, when I'm you know, doing gallery lectures or what have you, is this idea of, of like, you know, who are you making your art for, you know? And I got an undergraduate degree. I got two graduate degrees, all in studio arts. And um, I come back to the res and I'm like, wow, you know, uh, my own community, do they really understand what I'm doing, you know? And, and so what I did was this. Um, here on a reservation, we don't really have any kind of law enforcement or anything. And we were on dirt roads at that time. And so what I did was this, I painted a series of road signs, those black and yellow road signs that you see every day when you're driving around town or what have you. And what I did was I, I, I painted them in our native language. Uh, the queer language is a threatened language, okay? And so I wanted to, uh, to kind of promote our language and remind our, our community that we're special people, right? That we're not just like everybody else. And so I didn't ask permission or anything like that. I just went around the reservation and I installed these uh, around our different dirt roads here on the reservation. And guess what? Uh, nobody here in my community, nobody thought it was art, <laughs> right? They're like, oh, what the heck? What does this say? And, you, know, you know what they thought? They ended up thinking it was pretty cool. And they would stop by, you know, like my dad's house at the time. He's passed away now. But they would say, hey, how do you pronounce that or what have you? And it was really like this kind of, it, it, it did kind of stir some interest in relearning our, our languages for our young people, you know. And so, you know, for me, it wasn't important. It was not important whether they saw it as art or not. Um, you know, the fact that they thought they were pretty cool, that's enough for me. You know, it's uh, making art is not simply about selling stuff or showing in a gallery or museum. It's about engaging the community. That's I take that very seriously. And so there you see this sign is Netach Muka. 
And that translates roughly into I am singing. And so the smaller text that you see there in English is the, the English translation, okay? Uh, by the way, those were up for about six weeks. And then one of my cousins got drunk and went around with a shotgun and shot them up. <laughs> I call that reservation art criticism. Uh, and my dad called me, he says, son, I have something to tell you. I was like, oh yeah, what's going on? He's like, yeah, someone went around and shot up your signs. I was like, oh, you know, that's, that's the life of a sign on the reservation. You know, it, it, it wasn't meant to last forever because nothing lasts forever. Right. But I, I, I found it very interesting that many people in the community were upset that they were destroyed. And that shows that they took ownership in it. And I love that. I'm so thankful for my community for, for doing that. And that's the role of the artist in, in my eyes. So I've done a lot of different things. And uh, I just had a show recently at the Palm Springs Art Museum, it, right at the beginning of COVID, actually. And it was like, I think it was 78 works spanning 30 years. And, you know, it was very cool to have a museum show and stuff. But one of the things I've always said is the hardest thing for a native artist is to show your work in a professional setting where your own community can see it. There's not a lot of cutting edge art centers on Indian reservations, you understand? So I was really happy to have that show there at uh, Palm Springs Art Museum. But when the people who saw it, I bet they probably thought that it seemed like there were probably 30 different artists in this gallery when it was all just me. And that's something I like to do. I like to change up. I don't like to be comfortable. If I get too comfortable, I feel like I'm not taking enough risks. I think you have to fail to make good art. I make a lot of bad art to get to the good stuff. That's part of it, you know. So this is uh, entitled Glyph Number One, and this is where I was using Google Earth as a sketchbook. So the the image you see there is actually a four foot by four foot digital print on canvas. And what I did was I was pulling up these track home. Um, neighborhoods in Southern California. And I was using Photoshop to paint in the streets. And look at the kind of interesting pattern that you see, but it's actually a photograph, right, from, from Google Earth. So sometimes people get and look at it and you can see who has a pool or, you know, how big the yards are or what have you. And you know what I was thinking when I was doing this, was uh, the Nazca lines of Peru. If you're familiar with ancient art down in uh, Central America or in South America, you know, the Mayan, the Aztecs, and the Inca all did these amazing earthworks. And so these are, these are where these paths are worn into the desert floor. And it's amazing. And there's a lot of speculation. Well, maybe that helped from the aliens to do this. It's all this ridiculous ex explanation. When these are people who who cared and who had, who were industrious and who had very serious spiritual beliefs, right? And so it's, it's in things like the Nazca lines that I'm kind of channeling when I'm thinking about Google Earth, right? And using that as a sketchbook. And I, I like, I like creativity. I like to challenge myself. I didn't know if it was going to work out very good. I kind of like how, how they ended up turning out, however. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of important in my life is I am a traditional uh, a Koya bird singer. And um, they're uh, down there on your campus. So the Kumeyaay, I know a number of Kumeyaay singers down there as well who sing with the gourd rattles. Uh, they Chances are they've performed on your campus. So we do the same thing up here. And so getting involved with bird singing, you know, this, this Kauia tradition almost died out late 80s. There was only a handful of people that were still doing it. Now we have this kind of renaissance and there's a lot of singers this day, which is, which is great, I think. I saw a group uh, not too long ago. The youngest singer, I think, was about five which is just fabulous because because you know that's going to be the future, you know? So, but what about as an artist? So I wanted to participate and I do sing, I do dance, my daughters dance, but I wanted to participate as an artist. So I started making these, these simple acrylic paintings and of these birdsong rattles, uh, people say uh, maraca, right? Which of course is, is culturally is not what, what we do, right? But that's imposed on us, and I, I get it, you know. But here I am, this, this guy, you know, uh, museum artist or whatever, and I'll actually do these paintings. I'll set them up at just cultural gatherings in a football field or in a high school gym. And I, again, I want to engage my community, and I'll sell these for $100, $200, $300 a piece. And it's interesting because the tourists come through, and they're like, I want Indian art. I don't want a maraca right? Because they don't know what Indian art even is. They don't know what Indian tribes or Indian culture is, right? And it's interesting because I've never sold one of these to a non-native. 
There are always our own people who are so happy to finally see something other than buffalo or you know eagles gliding, uh, you know, through the through the wind, and they're like, "Oh, this is us," you know. And I think that's part of the role of the artist is you have to represent your community. So there I am. This is actually in a high school gym, and I bring all kinds of my stuff to this. You know, I turn it into a little museum exhibit right there in a high school gym because I want my community to know that there's someone out there who's making art for them, okay? These uh, fancy, well-known, you know, artists in Paris or New York or where, wherever, um, they're not making artwork for my community. They're, they're, you know, nobody thinks about my community, really. And so I, I think it, I take it very seriously that this is my role as an artist, my responsibility. So here's another painting. I call it my blanket painting. And so you see this kind of uh, pattern of the, the gourd rattles, again, kind of paying homage and acknowledging this renaissance and bird singing that I see happening the last 20 years. And then I don't know if you can tell what are the four corners of the canvas there, um, but many times, so the little things you see here are uh, abalone shell buttons that have actually been sewn right into the canvas. So there's a little bit of sculpt sculptural element. And these are actually blank DVDs or CDs. And if you ever look at the back of a CD or a DVD, you'll notice that they have this kind of iridescent quality, very much like an abalone shell, if you're familiar with that. So I'm, you know, I don't want anyone to dig up my work, right, in 500 years and say, well, was this 1740 or 1830? Uh, simply by putting those discs on there, immediately you know late 20th century, early 21st century. And with that, I want to express, uh, you know, that um, I have a variety of influences and it's, it's within the tribe, but it's also outside of the tribe. So here are a few artists that I, I really like and respond to. Uh, uh, Martin Poirier is an African-American artist uh, as, and sculptor. And that's his, this kind of cone kind of shape here in the middle. And he actually left the United States. He went to Africa and he learned uh, traditional folk style uh, furniture making. And then he comes back and then he starts doing these abstract sculptures, which I think are great, right? Uh, this is uh, Rachel White, White Reed down here in the bottom. And she gets these, and there's one here in Southern California, if you want to look it up. Uh, she, she goes into uh, old buildings, abandoned buildings, and then she takes a spray of concrete. She covers the entire inside of the building. Then she lets it solidify. Then she tears down the building. And so what you have is a a shell of the inside of that building, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, here's a, um, uh, an, another uh, artist, um, uh, Fred Wilson, up in the, the silverware looking stuff. And he, he's fabulous. He, uh, he actually went into uh, some museums in the Northeast and he did a project called Mining the Museum where he, so he put together this, this art show of 19th century American metalwork. So here you see the tea set, right? And you see the goblets or whatever. I don't know if you can see that right in the middle that's dark, but right in the middle of it are a set of slave chains, right? So, ooh, so he's, he goes into the museum and he's kind of contrasting this kind of what museums typically do, which is all the fancy stuff, but he's bringing in a bit of this kind of social reality of this country, right? That people don't like to think about. So I look at a lot of art. I look at media, I look at film. I'm influenced by a variety of things. So like, for instance, this painting uh, entitled Our Lady of San Jacinto uh, is acrylic on, on canvas. And you see, I've, I've arched the canvas a bit, right? And uh, that plant, some of you are probably familiar with that plant, it's uh, yucca or yucca whiplii. That plant is actually important to my people in terms of food, but also fibers, okay? And even soap, it has this kind of soapy quality when you mix it with water. And so it's a, a, we don't worship the plant, but it's important to our survival for, for the last few thousand years. And so I wanted to kind of pay homage to that plant and, and, and make it special, make people realize how important it is to California uh, people and Kauia people. And so I surround it with this halo of the birdsong rattles, right? Trying to um, you know, show that it's important. And then I don't know if this reminds you of any images or, or, or what have you, but what I was looking at and influenced by you know, on this painting 
was the Virgin of Guadalupe images that you see throughout, uh, you know, uh, Western Hemisphere Catholicism. And I, I recognize the shape, the halo around the Virgin Mary. I see that same shape in those flower blossoms on the plant. And then the halo with the, the rattles and the shape of the canvas. So you can see, um, for me, anything goes. A any influence can be a, a positive influence. Even negative things can be an influence on you. Uh, and, and you've got to bring it into your work, I think. So, so one of the things I'm doing now lately is, again, I, I run my family's cattle ranch, right? And so uh, I started making uh, uh, these branding irons as sculpture, okay? So the, the branding iron that you see up there in the upper left corner, you can see it's backwards, but when you burn it, it's, it's, it's right, right? It's uh, forward, and it says Indian on it. And the title of it is To the Distinguishing Collector. Uh, it could have been To the Discriminating Collector as well, because I can't tell you how many times throughout my life I've been asked, well, do you make Native American art? And again, what are they talking about? They're talking about probably feathers. They're talking about beads or certain colors or certain imagery. But everything I do is Native American art or Kawea art, because that's the lens that I view uh, the world with, right? And so I got mad, to be honest with you. And I was like, um, okay, you want, you want me to be an Indian artist? Here, here's a branding iron. That way you can brand me. You can stereotype me. Uh, you can categorize me however you want. So that was kind of like a protest artwork. And then afterwards, I was like, oh, well, I should use that thing. So I put it in the fire, heated it up, and then I burned the word Indian into a piece of paper just to kind of like to emphasize this kind of fact that it's unfair to be pushed into these categories. We say we want artists to have freedom of expression and all that. I don't find that to actually be true. We want uh, the, the, the contemporary art world wants art that's easy to sell, easy to market, right? And easy to write books upon and categorize as this is Native American art. And I just refuse to do that. And so Here's a, another print, a branded print is what I'm calling these. And there you see the branding iron. I'm taking a torch and heating it up red hot. And then I'll burn it in the paper. Sometimes I'll flip it over. I'll do different kind of configurations. Uh, and it's this idea of, of me being branded as being one thing. And I will tell you, that I really got back into doing this around 2016 when uh, the Trump administration uh, was put into office because uh, this branding process is kind of violent and I'm burning the paper, right? And there's a lot of heat involved and such. And I am not a violent person, but around 2016, I saw that, that rise in ethnic violence here in this country. And I was like, you know what? I, I need to get that in the art. I need to represent that. And so that's why I returned to doing these branding iron uh, prints around that time. Here's another one, again, with that same branding iron. And then uh, on the right-hand side, that's a book that was given to me by, by another artist. It was decommissioned out of a public library. And the title of the book is Disinherited, The Lost Birthright of the American Indian. And it was uh, written by a non-native, of course, right? I think 95% of all books about Indians aren't actually written by native people. So this for artist friend of mine, she hands me this book and she says, oh, I thought you'd like that. And I was like, oh, cool, set it down. And I branded it, right? And, you know, I, I laugh and I say, this is like the ultimate plagiarism because I've taken this non-native person's book and I've branded it and turned it into my sculpture. And so when I do these branded books, I actually open up to the title page, I sign it and date it, and now it's my sculpture. It's no longer that author's book. Uh, and I say that kind of in jest. But that's, you know, who controls the narrative, I think, is an, is an important question. So here's another book that I did. It's entitled Indian Painters and White Patrons. And I, uh, uh, this was the first art history book where actually, this was in the 70s, where Indian art was actually maybe possibly considered as art. Before the 70s, Native American objects were considered, you know, ethnographic historical oddities. They were seen as trinkets or crafts or what have you. And in that book, uh, the author actually talks about how a lot of Native American art had gotten in very bad. It, it wasn't well made anymore. And it was just these collectors who were not from the community who were buying anything that looked Indian, whether it was actually Indian or not, right? 
And so the, this idea of who controls the narrative, again, at this time, 95% of all the books written about Indians were not written by Indians. And so I started thinking about that. So I did another one of these gumball sculptures, these gumball machine sculptures. And the title of this is Indian Wisdom. And I don't know if you can see, but that's my picture on the front. So that's a little bit of that Indian humor. I think that's hilarious that I put my, my, myself on the artwork that's called Indian Wisdom. You see it has the end of the trail at the top and again, that Greek column. What I'm, what I'm doing with those Greek columns is I'm showing that this, is not, this, is, this doesn't represent a native perspective, this, this idea of Indian wisdom and all that. It represents this kind of stereotyped, romanticized, uh, white American, white European uh, version of what maybe an, an Indian person is. But here's the thing on this one, the capsules, they're inside, you can put your cord and you crank it and you can get your, your capsule. And what I did was this, I bought a number of books written by Native American authors, poetry, fiction, social sciences, all kinds of different books. And I, I'm afraid I destroyed these books, but what I did was I cut the pages out of each book and one page went into each capsule. So when you put your 25 cents in, you really are getting Indian wisdom. You're getting writings from native scholars and native artisans and such. And I also tried to choose books that had printed on each page, the name of the author and the title of the book. Hopefully it would turn these people on to going out and searching and getting some of that Indian wisdom from the actual books that, they, that they've written. Now, related to the, um, the, the branding iron prints, I also did this uh, self-portrait. And this is actually from, the, everything you see here is words. And I have, I, I was at, long time ago, actually, I was at like an office supply store and they had this make your own rubber stamp kit. And I guess it was for like, if you're doing a mail out, like your Christmas cards, let's say, and if you wanted to put your self-addressed stamped, right, or, or your, your address on your envelope, you could just stamp all of them and then you don't have to write them all out, right? And so I was like, huh, how can I use that as a drawing tool? And so what I did was I ended up using this rubber stamp. You stamp it on the ink and you stamp it on the paper and it's dark. But if you don't stamp it on the ink again, it's a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter. Well, that's how drawing works. It's the same way with using charcoal or graphite. So I stamped my self-portrait and there's a detail that gives you a sense of what up, up close it looks like. But this is what I did. I stamped my self-portrait with the names of the six most prescribed depression meds in 2016 when I made this, okay? Now, pretty weird, right? Why would I do that? Well, I mentioned that, you know, there was a state-sponsored genocide here in California, and I'm lucky to be here, okay? And if I focus on all the things that my tribe has experienced, my ancestors have suffered, right? It's a tragic, tragic story, right? And if I focus just on that, I would probably fall in to a depression I would never you know, uh, recover from, right? Instead, I tend to try to focus on the miracle that we're still here uh, and I'm, I'm, I feel blessed, right? But this self-portrait is part of that, you know, that's that weight, this history, this heavy history, that's the weight I carry into the studio when I go and I, I make my work, right? And so you can see, again, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place doing all kinds of different things. And again, in terms of the role of the artist, uh, a lot of artists, they, they approach society like with a magnifying glass and they say, oh, this is wrong with society. I'm going to make an art work about it. This is wrong with society. I'm going to make an art work about it. This is wrong, right? And they're, they're on the outside looking in. And I don't like that, actually. So I, I try to approach my art like through a mirror. And I, the Ethnopoly game, there are aspects of that game that I find offensive. And I'm the one who made it. Right. Uh, that's that's kind of where you get to the truth, I think, of of of, of art, I think. And, um, you know, one of the things I've learned is the more personal I make my work and I'm not talking like how I want people to think I am. I mean, deep down all my, you know, my personality, but also my own prejudices, my own shortcomings. I mean, you got to be really brutally honest with yourself if you can get there in your inside your your mind and your soul when you're in the studio here's the thing it's very personal right but if you can do that it becomes universal because as human beings we all have 
uh, shared feelings of anxiety, of love, of desire, of envy, of rage, right? And so this is kind of how I view my role as an artist. And so oftentimes I use words like responsibility, right? Uh, I use words like uh, um, obligation. I don't talk, I don't even think about self-expression. I think that's as natural as breathing. You know, none of us are thinking about our breathing until I mention it. And then you all of a sudden you're right. You're conscious of it, but creativity is the same. You don't have to think about it. Just give yourself permission to do it. So this was that, right. That ongoing Kawea road project that I was doing. I have since abandoned the English uh, translations and I've just started doing these signs in the Kawea language. So Muka is the name of our creator. And like God, right? And so I love the, the the arrows in all directions and then the name of our creator. And so I put these up just to remind and to validate Native people today that we, we have a belief system and it's just as valuable as any other belief system. Because I, I really do, you know, we've been stereotyped Native people um, and, and romanticized for so long. And when I teach my classes in Native American studies, I often talk about the indigenous intellectual tradition. And a lot of times my students hear that and they kind of blink three or four times and like, what, right? Because they've gone through all these years of education and they've never heard those words placed together, the indigenous intellectual tradition. And I see myself as part of that. And why these things are important, I think, is because a lot of the problems in the world today have already been solved by indigenous people globally, but nobody's asking us the question, right? And so this is that intellectual tradition, the indigenous intellectual tradition that has offerings if, if anybody wants to kind of listen. So here's some more road signs. These are more recent. I, I installed these in the city parks in Palm Springs, California. And they're, again, I don't think you need to know the English to actually understand what it's saying. And so by installing these in public places, I wanna remind the non-natives that this is not the new world. What, what do you mean new world? We've been here over uh, 15,000 years and that's the conservative number, 15,000 years. Uh, we believe it's much longer than that, right? So I want to remind people that Indian people were here before the Apple store, before Walmart, before Costco, right? But also for the native people who live here in Southern California, I want to remind them and I want to validate their, their existence here in the 21st century. When you're native, you're constantly talked about, well, back in the good old days or when you were a great nation or what have you. No, 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 we're here today and we're survivors. We are not only existing, and persevering, we are becoming successful uh, people right here in, in California. And we are an important part of the, the fabric of America, I think. And so these signs have taken various forms. And this is that, that uh, you remember, this is that yucca plant. So I've done this, that panel is our name of our, uh, that Kuya name for that plant. So there is the painting. So you see uh, this one plant, I've done a road sign, I've done a painting and I've also done a sculpture, right? So I, I do a lot of experimentation. I try new things constantly. That's what keeps it interesting for me. Um, always trying new things and challenging myself. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when we talk about native culture, I notice my students, a lot of times we end up talking about cultural appropriation. And a lot of times we see that in the entertainment industry, we see it in the music uh, field, we see it in fashion, right? But I have a different take on cultural appropriation, which is that I myself, let me just tell you, the queer creation story, our, our creation belief, there are aspects of that story that would make really interesting, cool art, okay? And I won't make it. OK, because I'm way, you know, I, I don't care if the millennials go into Coachella in a headdress, to be honest with you. I'm much more concerned with myself and I'm much more concerned with, you know, there are aspects of queer culture that are not for you. OK, and I am not going to appropriate from my own culture. Right. And so anytime I, I'm expressing something about my culture, if, if there's any time where I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable with it and, and believe me, I have elders who will call me out and will, you know, point my face. Right. If I do something wrong, that's part of being in a tribe. That's part of that communal value, that way of, that we live. And so I'm way more concerned with appropriating from my own culture. And you guys can think about how you go through the world and, and whether that might be true of you or if, or if you've seen that kind of thing.
And so one of the things I also do is I avoid cultural stereotypes, okay? So you hear a lot of people today, and there's a lot of people that are trying to get in touch with their indigeneity. And a lot of times they end up grasping at these kind of pan-Indian topics like Mother Earth or Turtle Island. I appreciate the land acknowledgement at the beginning of tonight's uh, event. Uh, when UCR was working on their land acknowledgement, uh, there were people saying, well, what about we should mention Mother Earth and we should mention Turtle Island. And I'm like, Turtle Island? Uh, that's that's a, a concept from the Anishinaabe people up past the Great Lakes region. So that, and if, if I were to provide you with the Kuya creation story, you would find no reference to Mother Earth or Turtle Island. Uh, you would find Mukut and Temayawet, those are our twin creators. You would find stories about the Moon Maiden or Menil, and you would also find stories about Isil or Coyote. So we have to be an, a, a famous Kuya leader from the 20th century uh, by the name of Rupert Costo. He, he was uh, quite a scholar. And he said, you know, it wasn't the federal government and assimilation, which, uh, you know, was the biggest uh, threat to uh, 20th century Native culture. It was pan-Indianism, this kind of generic one-size-fits-all kind of uh, Indianism that he was warning against. So I would say that my tribe, the art form that my tribe is no, most known for uh, are basketry. Okay. And so when I had my show at the Palm Springs Art Museum, I, uh, I, they gave me access to some of their collection. And so here we have two baskets that were uh, woven by Native women, by Kawea women. Okay. And so I got to look at these and, and touch them and smell them and all that. And I should mention that for the Kawea culture, basketry was primarily a women's art. OK, now immediately. All right. Don't get offend, offended by that, because you have to get away from this kind of Western European American hierarchy where somehow men are up here and women are down here for tr traditional indigenous cultures. Many of them, you take that hierarchy and you lay it over on its side and it's a spectrum of experience. And so here in traditional Kauia culture, we had some tasks that were meant for women. We had some tasks that were meant for men. It wasn't better or worse or higher or lower. It was a spectrum of experience, right? And so I don't make baskets because I respect our traditional gender roles within our society. So here you see the flower, the five-pointed flower in the middle. And then here, these little designs are actually uh, basket designs for bats that fly around at night and eat insects, right? And I want to point out that e even the negative here kind of points to this like five-pointed star or flower. Here, let me, can you see it in there, right? And so where does that come from? Well, it just so happens, you know, I said that my environment you know, like colors how I see the world. That's my lens, right? Well, these, these basket makers going back for thousands of years, they were also influenced by their environment. So the plant, the two pictures on the left are pivot, and that's our traditional tobacco plant. And then kixaval, also known as jimson weed, uh, on, the, on the right there, these are both some of our sacred plants, okay? And I wanna point out that each one has five points, right? And if you look at the points here, five, right? So these are the things that are influencing those basket makers. And again, I'll just go back, right? Influenced by the environment. Well, I'm the same way. I do the same thing. And so I wanted to pay homage to the basketry tradition, but I wanted to do so in my own way as a, as a man, right? I can't do baskets or I shouldn't do baskets, but also as a sculptor. So I started doing these continuum baskets. And so do you see the five-pointed star and the flower, right? So this is a continuum, continuum basket flora from 2017. And this is made entirely out of crushed aluminum cans. So both soda cans and beer cans. So the blue you see there is like Pepsi, but it's also like Labatt's uh, beer. Uh, the white or the silver that you see is Coors Light and Diet Coke. There might be some white monster energy drinks in there. The green is um, Mountain Dew. It's uh, Sprite. The yellow in the middle is Squirt, okay? So I'm using the colors of the cans to make the, and just like the basketry, and I go back, see the little coils going round and round? So I make these the same exact way. I just make them bigger. This one's about five feet across. 
And I'm talking about this beautiful basketry tradition, okay? And so after 2017, the Palm Springs Art Museum asked me to commission a, a new can for them. And so this is the sketch I made just with my daughter's markers that I stole out of her, out of her room. And there's the five-pointed uh, tobacco flower. And you see the bats, the design from the earlier uh, basket, the, the, the black inverted triangles, that's the bats. And then the little bit of blue, because those flowers actually open up at night and that's when the bats come out, it, it felt like that was right. So I added the blue to kind of symbolize the night sky. And so are you ready? Here it is. Here's the final, okay? And it ended up being over 1,800 crushed aluminum soda cans and beer cans. Uh, and it's about eight feet tall. And so you may be wondering, well, what's up with the, the beer cans? What's up with the soda cans, right? Well, you remember when you, when you do something else, something familiar, people will kind of, they'll, 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 oh, it's familiar. I'm going to check this out, right? But also, I never want to be uh, accused of, of romanticizing my own cultural experience. And both alcoholism and diabetes are, are, are illnesses that are plaguing contemporary tribal communities. And if I don't acknowledge that, then I'm, I'm just as bad as the non-natives who ran, romanticize our culture. So the thing is, is this, so the alcoholism is in there, the diabetes is in there, both those things have impacted my family's life for the last few generations, okay? It's real, I can tell you. And so it's in there, but when you get back and you look at it, this work is it's kind of beautiful, right? And it's like the culture. Yeah, we got problems, but it's beautiful. We're still beautiful people with a beautiful history and we have beauty to offer the world. And so there you see kind of where the sketch and the actual thing, I was amazed how <laughs> that it actually matched the sketch uh, pretty well. And I've only done three of these and I might be doing, actually uh, might be doing another one for another uh, um, commission uh, next year. And so with that, I, uh, we say, uh, did you know the Kuya language, we have no word for thank you. So we say, achima pe'ipachem kal, achima is good. It's good that we're gathered here together and we shared this moment together. I am appreciative of your time. I'm appreciative of your attention. And with that, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. Well, All right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> We're going to give y'all a few minutes. If you have any questions, type those out in the chat. If not, we also have a few questions prepared. And I just wanted to add that um, if you do have questions, make sure that you set the chat to all panelists and attendees or everyone, if that's an option, too. Uh, uh, Reese is asking, do I have a favorite piece? That's kind of like, you know, asking you if you have a favorite kid. Uh, I will say I do have some favorite pieces. I like the can basket that we ended with. Uh, I'm really into um, the, the branding iron stuff that I've been doing lately. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, it's kind of funny, but sometimes uh, I make stuff that I don't like, but it needs to be made. You know, if, if I'm making an artwork about genocide, how can you like that? <laughs> you know, it needs to be made. It needs to be put out there. That's probably why I don't sell a lot of artwork because people don't want genocide hanging over the couch, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, most of the time I rely on, on universities. I show in university galleries. Sometimes I show in museums, in nonprofit centers, but I don't do a lot of like uh, uh, private commissions, you know, for paintings or stuff because most of the time people aren't really they're not really into it. <laughs> oh, I see another question in the chat. Uh, have you ever collaborated with other Native artists um, or sharing traditions? Okay. Uh, okay. So it's so funny you should ask that. I have not collaborated with other artists throughout my career. Uh, maybe I'm a control freak. <laughs> I don't know. But actually, it's funny you should ask that, uh, uh, Robert, because I actually recently collaborated on, a, on six pieces. This is my, uh, it's what I'm calling my native, uh, my Gerald Clark Native American jewelry collection. Because, you know, Native American jewelry is like really hot, right? And you see it in all these fancy stores or whatever. But this is what I did is I bought six pairs of official police handcuffs and I collaborated with a beadwork artist and I had her bead them for me. 
And so this is my Native American jewelry. And so, of course, I can't just do jewelry. I got to talk about incarceration rates. Did you know incarceration rates per capita, uh, as well as people murdered by by policemen on on duty, uh, that uh, uh, Native Americans suffer from that more per capita, per population, right, than any other uh, any other population. A lot of people don't know that. So by doing this quote unquote jewelry collection of handcuffs, and the thing is, is they're beaded. So they're beautiful. But at the same time, they have this whole like dark history of incarceration too. So it's typical me to do something nice and then to throw something kind of socially negative about it, uh, you know, in there. But that's a, the most recent thing I've done as a collaboration was the, the, the handcuffs. And actually just earlier today, I found out they're going to be, all six pairs are going to be in a show down in Long Beach in uh, late January into February of next year. Oh, so uh, Camilla is asking, how has my artistic practice changed or evolved over time? I think as uh, Camilla, as, I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten braver. And I'm I'm I make more bad art, <laughs> and that sounds funny, right? But you know, society has done a horrible job of convincing us that failure is a bad thing, but you always learn from failure, right? And so, my students, when I teach an art class, uh, if my students aren't failing a little bit, I'm telling I tell them they're not trying hard enough. You know, you need to try harder. You need to push yourself farther. So I do make a lot of bad art. And I think I'm braver now that I'm older that I don't feel like maybe I have to prove anything anymore. And then also, I think early in my career, like when I was in college, I just wanted to be known as an artist that happened to be Native. And then once I graduated and I met other Native artists, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I am a Native artist because they were doing works that were similar to mine in terms of you know, interest in our tribal traditions and stereotypes and romanticism and all that. But even now I've, I've altered and I've changed to where now that I'm even older, I, uh, um, I, I don't even think of myself as a Native American artist. I really think of myself as a Kawea artist because that's the lens that I bring into the studio. Um, and, and so I, I, I think I'll continue to evolve. One of the things I've already, I've always told myself is I hope to be making the best art of my life the day before I pass away, you know, and until then it's just experimenting and trying new things and growing as a, as a human being and also as an artist. And I will say to this, that I'm not just an artist, you know, I'm a professor, I'm a tribal member. I am a father, you know, I'm a rancher, you know, uh, sometimes when you're, you're, you're a, a mixed race person, Sometimes, you know, we find ourselves living in two worlds. Have you heard that argument before? And I'm like, man, I wish I only lived in two worlds. I live in like two dozen worlds, it seems like, you know, and I'm you know, code switching and I'm, I, you know, I'm trying on different things. And, and, you know, now I'm teaching at UCR, I'm in ethnic studies. I'm not even in the art department anymore. And so after 20 something years of teaching art, I switched to ethnic studies because I thought that'd be a neat little challenge. And uh, that's that's how you get to the good stuff, I think. That's how you grow. Um, <laughs> so what sparked my interest in becoming an artist? Uh, to be honest with you, I think all high school graduates should work uh, a fast food for five years before you go to college, because then you're going to be ready to get to work, I think. But really, you know, growing up poor, uh, I found myself like like, you know, artists like to say, oh, we're like philosophers and academics and stuff, but we're also... We're, we're, we're craftsmen. And I enjoy the, the, the joy that I get from making art is actually not showing it, it's making it. And I enjoy using my hands. The physical aspect of making art is what I really like. And I think I got that from growing up poor, building forts, building skateboard ramps, you know, uh, making our own Halloween costumes, all those kinds of things. I think that's where my art my impulse comes from. And I do believe that the creator is it endows each of us with a certain kind of leaning towards, you know, there's some people that are going to be our healers. There are some people that are going to be our leaders. There are some people who are going to be our ceremonial people. And there's some people who are going to be our makers. And I think that's, I, I think I've, I was lucky that I found that path. Uh, to be honest with you, I was told I was too dumb for for college when I graduated high school. What the, the counselor really meant was I was too brown and too poor, okay? 
And I actually went to college because I was chasing a girl who I then later married. So that's why I went to college. But once I got there, I was like, wow, this is cool. I like learning new things. And I just kept going. And and now I'm a college professor. Who knew? I think some of my high school teachers probably rolling over in their graves right now hearing that. Uh, Do I like working ethnic studies department at UCR? Uh, I have a love-hate relationship with uh, teaching. I love the classroom. I love the students. Uh, probably just like UCSD, uh, UCR is very diverse student body, not so diverse when it comes to faculty at UCR. And so I really like having uh, diverse uh, uh, students in my classroom. And you know why? Because the dirty little secret that I'll let you in on is I learn from the students. And that's what keeps it interesting for me. And so, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I really am enjoying. I, I, I did teach at a private high school of the arts for a while. And I like that mentoring uh, quality about teaching that age. Because in college, yeah, class is over, everyone's gone. Everybody's got lives and stuff. So I do kind of miss that. But I do enjoy teaching. In fact, uh, if I were to provide you, and you could look up versions of it online, the Kuya creation story. Teaching is sacred in the Kuya uh, uh, creation story. And so I take what I do very seriously. And, um, you know, I, 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 I have the ability of, uh, to talk, you know, the gift of gab or what have you. But I, that's years in the making. Uh, you, you, there's an art to teaching. And um, just having the knowledge doesn't do it. You have to be able to convey the knowledge. Okay, so this is asking about uh, Thanksgiving. So I will tell you, thank you for that question, because I get asked that every year, right? You're like, what do you celebrate Thanksgiving and how can people? Um, there is, maybe I can share a link with you. Um, Kacha Rizling Baldi, who is a uh, tribal member from the Hoopa tribe in Northern California. She did an online talk. Um, let me. I'm just going to put her name in here. Maybe you can find it. And she did a talk last year about um, uh, indigenous forms of gratitude. And, you know, I think I, I, I don't like all these snarky memes that we're going to see next week about, oh, the true Thanksgiving and all that kind of. Oh, it should be Kacha. So it's C-U-T. Sorry, I spelled that wrong. Um, but, um, you know. Uh, something going on right now is there's a federal gov- uh, a court challenge to a law called ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And if if that if tribes lose that lawsuit, um, that could un- that could drastically impact tribal sovereignty in this nation. So you know um, this Thanksgiving, instead of thinking about the past, maybe think about the tribal communities here. So I appreciate. Uh, is it your question? And there are tribes in, in the, the local area that you can um, support somehow. And one of the things I say in my classes is at some point, if you're here in California, at some point, you're probably going to get the opportunity to vote on a state law that's going to impact tribal communities. And I tell my students, I don't care how you vote. I just want you to be an informed voter. So learn what you can about where you're at. I appreciate the nativelands.ca because anywhere you're at in the world, you can find out whose native lands you are and just be a good, uh, just be a good uh, ally. I think that's that's major. <laughs> Uh, so Camilla, my artistic pr- practice, I have a, a studio, what I call the shop around back here. And um, I go in there uh, into my shop. Uh, and the first thing I do is I clean my shop before I start working on an artwork. And I put all the tools away. I sweep up. I get it all nice and perfect for me. And then I start in. And I found that I don't like working for just a half hour or an hour or two hours. A lot of times I go in there and I'll be in there for 10, 16, 18 hours working on something. And then once I get so tired, I can't do anything anymore. I'm convinced that I, I'm a fool and I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. I get mad and I just leave the shop and I come back up here to the house and sulk. And I go to bed and then the next morning I get up, I go to the shop, I clean the shop and I start right back in again. I guess I'm a masochist. You know, I I hear some people say, oh, I love making art. It's so relaxing. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like I'm going to war. And maybe, maybe if I was talented, it would, would, maybe it would be easier, right? Maybe I would find it relaxing, but uh, you know, it's a constant struggle. And like I said earlier, anytime I get too comfortable in the studio, I quit what I'm doing because Boy, I tell you, people compliment you when you're an artist. Oh, I love your work and blah, 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 right? 
And before you know it, this is the saddest thing. You start plagiarizing yourself and you start cranking out the same thing over and over again. And as soon as I feel like I'm starting the, down that road, I quit what I'm doing and I'll start like glass blowing or I'll start, you know, doing something completely different. And that's part of the reason why I, my art looks so varied is because I, I, I don't like to be comfortable. I, 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 I'm suspicious of comfort. Uh, uh, and so I, th that's kind of how my process is. I, I force myself into uncomfortable uh, uh, areas. Oh, Mira's asking how you know, that's the, the, the eternal question. When is something finished? A lot of times what I do when I think something's finished is I look at it and I live with it for a while. And if it's begging for something else, then it's not finished. But if, if I can't really think of what else to do with it and it's, it seems complete, then I consider it finished. So it's, it's, that's not an easy thing. And I have actually come back to artwork 10 years later and said, you know what, I think I'm going to do this and I'll change it, right? So sometimes that happens as well. I typically, when I finish a work, I really like it. Then five years later, I'm like, what was I thinking? That's horrible, right? And then 10, 15 years later, I was like, oh, that was pretty cool. You know, so it's kind of like this kind of love-hate relationship I have with my work. <laughs> um, I have another question, another follow-up. Um, are you working on any new projects right now? Yeah, I've got uh, several things in process right now. Uh, one of the things, and some of you, some of you may have heard of James Luna. He's a, a Payom Kawicham, a Luzenio artist who passed away in 2018. He was world famous, uh, a California native artist, and he was a good friend of mine. And one of his, he was a performance artist primarily. And one of his last works, um, I, I wanted to do an artwork inspired by his last work. So I took the audio from his last performance, his words, and I turned it into a karaoke track. So I don't know if you guys karaoke or not. I'm not talking singing, but I'm going to have a video monitor in the museum and some footprints on the floor so you can stand in his shoes and you can say the words of his last performance in exactly the same cadence that he said it before he passed away. And it's kind of, yeah, it's paying homage, it's paying respect. Um, you know, we Indian people, we respect our elders, we respect our, our ancestors. And so that's where it's coming from. So I'm doing that. Um, if you've heard of uh, high desert test sites, I'm doing an installation for that in the spring. I, yeah, I've got a lot of projects going right now, actually. 